Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. And brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Me and Most of the Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We're here with a terrific gentleman who's the former president of American Society of Anesthesiologists and also chairman emeritus and distinguished professor over at the uh, Department of Anesthesiology at the uh, State of New York and also... Um, He's the author of over 100 articles, including New England Journal of Medicine and also um, Lancelot and more. And he's also um, served as the health policy advisor to Senator Edward Kennedy. And he also has a new book aiming to basically explain um, the critical role of the anesthesiologist and uh, who literally have your life in their hands and uh, subject to uh, manipulations that could, you know, you know, kill whatever. There's a mistake. But what actually goes on in the um operating room uh it's not what you see in like all the tv shows and everything and um what doctors do could turn to their consciousness and um and of course uh patient advocates and more and also a how-to book for um those wanting to uh pursue as well too and um live ladies and gentlemen from plus studios in beautiful downtown new york city the former president of american society of anesthesiologists and also the author book anesthesia without fear so relax and we're going to be very gently ladies and gentlemen the amazing Dr. James Cottrell. James, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon to you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you on board as well, too. So um, yeah. so let's just sit back and uh, relax here and, uh, you know, just uh, take a little jab. We'll just put you to rest here. You're former president of American Society, uh, anesthesiologist, uh, chairman emeritus and distinguished professor of the Department of Anesthesiology at the State of New York. You're also author of over 100 articles, including New England Journal and also um Lancelot and more too. You also the um you also have uh, the new book aiming to explain the critical role of the anesthesiologist, anesthesia without fear. And of course, you know, there's been stories behind that. And of course, you think about, you know, you know, taking anesthesia, you know, you think of you know so many things and so many associations, but we're here to um, you know, put put a kibosh to that. And before getting all that, uh James, tell us how I first got started. Well, I, I first got started in anesthesia. Uh, yes, just how, just how I first, uh, first got started. Okay, well, I went went to undergraduate school and then decided I wanted to be a doctor. So then I had to go to medical school for four years. And then I had to decide if I was going to specialize. So after my internship, I decided I was going into anesthesiology after a while. And then I decided I wanted to do neuroanesthesiology. And so that's what I do now. And it's been a long time that I've been doing anesthesia. And one of the things I always hated when I went down to see patients preoperatively was I would say, I'm the anesthesiologist. And they would say, Doc, I don't want to know anything about it. I just want to be asleep. And that really <laughs> bothered me. So I wanted to change that. Mm, that's really interesting. And what per, what precisely uh, you know got you into uh, the role or interest in being an anesthesiologist? Well, I was in, during my internship, I was doing a surgical internship and I was mostly holding retractors and staying awake all night, assisting the surgeons and the junior surgeons. And all of a sudden the patient had a cardiac arrest hmm. and we all stood back and, and in a few minutes, an anesthesiologist came in the room and started working on the patient and talking about physiology and pharmacology and the patient's diseases and illnesses and what anesthetics were being given and brought him back to life. And I said, oh my gosh, that is really interesting. And so then the next month I had an elective and there I went right off into anesthesiology. Hmm. That's rather interesting as well, too. And, um, and and of course, you know, being being under there as well, too. And of course, maybe you can just, um, you know, share about our experiences and maybe just some really interesting stories and some challenging ones as well, too. And, um, you, you know, some of the uh, more interesting stories that you had, like, say, that, um, you know, ah, I think, you know, what I'm talking about here. So <laughs> uh, you want to hear about anesthesia stories? Uh, yeah, that's the one thing we'd like to start off before we uh, get into the book as well, too. Like, you know, some of the stories like say, you know, like say they walk up laughing or a cat walked in or whatever. So uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not a real comedian because this is a very serious subject. But one of the other things I really hate is when we get an emergency with a head injury or a gunshot wound, the patient can't talk and there's no family with him or her. And then you have to decide what to do because this patient could have diseases that contraindicate certain anesthetics 
This patient could be allergic. This patient could have the ability to develop malignant hyperthermia. And I've had a number of those patients and I've held my breath until they've gotten through the surgery and operation uh, without a complication. So, mm -hmm. and, and of course, we're getting all those more little stories as well, too. And uh, what does it take to be a anesthesiologist and uh, what do they do before the surgery? What do they need to know? And also some of the stories and what to do, what not to do in the book Anesthesia While Out Fear with uh, Dr. James Cottrell. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the MikeWidenerShow.com, powered by SoundWeb Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. It's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention Mike Wagner's show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews. In Eve 11 and George by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forbes, Riley, and Manales. So grab your copy today for Goes Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms. Heard in over 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple as well, too. And also on BitChute, Rumble, and other podcast platforms coming soon. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles. Also, T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the MikeWidenerShow.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the... Uh, former president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, um, James Cottrell here on the Mike Wagner Show, also the book um, Anesthesia Without Fear, and, um, you know, you know, just a couple of things about it. Uh, what exactly precise you um, got you interested in to uh, start and write the book? Well, as I, I said before, uh, I, I would go down into the operating room in the morning and see my patients, and I would ask them what they, what they would like to have for anesthesia. And they would say, Doc, I don't want to know anything. Just put me out. So that would that made me really angry. So I wanted to write this book so I could empower people to help choose their anesthetics and help prevent some of the complications that might occur. There are a number of things you need to remember when you go for a surgery. And the first thing you need to remember is to ask to see your anesthesiologist. You know, some people think they can't see their anesthesiologist before surgery, and they think we're the unseen uh, doctor in the, in the operation. And that's generally because the nurse or nurse anesthetist sees the patient pre-op, and then they come into the operating room, and we put them to sleep with drugs that wipe out their memory. And then we take them to the recovery room and leave them there to, while they awaken from anesthesia. So they really don't see very much of us. So in order to prevent that, I've asked in this book that the patient ask to see their anesthesiologist. And not only that, there, there are two things you need to remember. You need to tell your anesthesiologist your entire medical history, uh, what surgery you've had before, what diseases you have, what drugs you've taken, no matter what kind of drugs they are. So you need to tell them everything about you, everything about you that could affect your anesthetic. Then you ask the doctor, Say, Doc, say, what, what are you going to give me? What's available? I'm, I'm having my hip replaced today. And I can you put me to sleep or can, can you block my hip so I don't have to have a general anesthetic? And then you ask the doctor to explain who's going to give the anesthetic and say, is someone going to be there to, with you to take over if you have to leave? And then ask him if that person is competent. And you want to know that he's going to stay with you during the entire procedure so that will protect you. And then you want to know what's going to happen after the operation. Am I going to be nauseous? Am I going to throw up? Can you give me something that will prevent that from happening? 
or will I have other pain and something and we'll need pain relief afterwards? Tell me, tell me all about this. So that's what I want the patient to be able to do. Hmm. That's quite interesting. It almost sounds like something almost like um, a how-to manual in a way. And um, you talk about the different types of uh, anesthesia, maybe just um, go over some of the types as well too and what it does and everything else. Well, there's conscious sedation and that's what you have with the colonoscopy or some minor procedure. And that means we can wake you up if we try to. If we call your name, you might blink your eyes or, or smile or something like that. So that's conscious sedation. Some people talk about twilight sleep. That would be even lighter than conscious sedation. That would be what the dentist would give you, it's nitrous oxide, 50%. But you don't want to have that. So we, we have twilight <laughs> sleep, we have conscious sedation. Then we have general anesthesia where you're completely unconscious. And no matter what we do, we can't awaken you. So it's not like sleep. That's the other thing that makes me angry when someone says, I want to go to sleep. Because anesthesia is not sleep. We use the most potent drugs to disarm your central nervous system and then reverse them at the end of the procedure. So, so it's very important that you not think this, this is sleep. So general anesthesia and then regional anesthesia is the next one down the, the, the pike. And so regional anesthesia would be for hip procedures and knee procedures. And we generally use regional anesthesia in the elderly because if they have inhalation anesthesia, post-operatively afterwards, they can develop delirium and become all crazy and tossing and turning. And then that can lead to cognitive dysfunction. And then 10% that may be permanent. So, so that's, that's the, why we use regional anesthesia in the elderly. Mm -hmm. And that's all the kind of types of anesthesia. We can do a local block just infiltrate this, the, the area where the surgery is being done. Mm -hmm. and, and what are the drugs that are being used with this uh, anesthesia, especially the general ones you had mentioned? Well, we use, first of all, we start by giving a drug that causes sedation and amnesia. So we like you to be a little happy and be able to forget if anything bad happens during the procedure. So the amnesia is there. And then we add some narcotic to get rid of the, the pain that you might have, an analgesic. And then we give you uh, continuous infusions of a drug like propofol or midazolam, along with short-acting narcotics like remifentanil or sufentanil. These, these are just synthetic drugs that are 100 or 1,000 times more potent than morphine. So they're very powerful drugs that we give to keep the anesthesia going. And then at the end of the procedure, we re reverse the narcotic and we wait for the turn the propofol off and it, it, it's gone in four or five minutes and we wow. wake you up and take you to the recovery room. Hmm. So that's sort of what we use. Mm -hmm. That's rather interesting as well too. And of course you, I cover some of the, um, you know, some of the situations I've been in, but what was the most worrying situation that you ever have been in? Well, it, it really bothers me when the patient doesn't wake up. You know, they're supposed to wake you up when you give them the reversal drug or when you turn off the anesthetic drug. So then you have to go through a whole series of neurologic exams to see what possibly could have happened during the procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, so, and, okay, you're going to say something else? Go ahead. Okay, it could be that the, the, they don't metabolize the muscle relaxant. So they're still paralyzed and they haven't been able to metabolize the muscle relaxant. So then we have to just wait because then it'll be four hours or so before they the, the muscle relaxant wears off and they come back. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and plus, uh, you also had um, seen what was going on in most of the operating rooms as well, too. And, um, you, you know, I see a lot of... Um, you know, TV shows like an involving emergency room, like, you know, you say, you know, you have, you have, I mean, basically you've seen all the TV shows out there. So it's like, you know, or, you know, the nurse and doctor discussing, you know, where to go for dinner or whatever else, or, you know, you know, some arguments and everything. What actually goes on in an operating room? Well, I think that some of that's right. You do talk in the operating room because we're human and we're in the operating room all day. So we have to know where we're going to eat that night. <laughs> so yeah, you have to talk to somebody during the operation or else, you you know, it gets, gets it, it, hopefully it gets really boring. And so you talk to the nurses and you talk to the surgeon. You have to know what the surgeon is doing because the surgeon could cut a major vessel 
And if you didn't know it, you wouldn't be ready to resuscitate the patient by giving them blood and fluids and bringing their heartbeat back. So you got to talk. So you got to talk about what's going on, the medicine that's being used, what surgical procedures being done. Is there a nurse around in case something? happens that can help us rather quickly to get blood and other things that we might need during the emergency. So so we do talk in the in the operating room. I don't know that we talk about you know interesting things, but we talk. Mm-hmm. Right. And and of course, you know, I wouldn't want to talk about what's what what they're gonna have for dinner in case something does happen. So I want to be you know, talking about that, pizza and um and just about everything else too. And of course, you know, patients also have the right as well too. We've gone over some of the things like with um, you know, what the patient wants, you know, can you give me like general anesthesia? And and of course you have a right to say no and whatever else. And um they also get to be serving as advocates as well, too. And um, you know, you know, patients do have rights when it comes to whatever anesthesia they want they don't want it or everything like that they can also play a patient advocate exactly if a patient says i don't want a regional anesthetic when i know it's the best anesthetic for the patient i can't force them to have a regional anesthetic so i have to give them the safest general anesthesia i can put together so mm -hmm. Right. And, and also involving, uh, of course, with the state of, um, you know, managed care as well, too, that uh, you've been doing this for quite some time. And um, and how does the uh, anesthesia, you, you know, um, you know, progressed uh, from the time you've done it up to now, they say, involving managed care, the choices and, um, you know, the, um, the, the style of uh, anesthesia and, of course, you know, the um, the science of it, you know, being advanced. How does it compare, you know, everything like, you know, say from 20, 30, 40 years ago up until now? Well, I think they're more careful about what they will pay for. So you have to be sure if you're going to have a special procedure or technique that you get it approved before the special procedure or technique, if it's an elective procedure. If you're going to have want some specialized pain control, like a spinal cord stimulator or a, a dorsal horn stimulator to control your pain for a few days or a block because you're going to be getting physical therapy, and you have to climb stairs after your right after your knee replacement, you're gonna need some pain relief. So you're gonna have to get that approved before you come to the hospital. And generally the doctor will do that, the surgeon or the anesthesiologist will do that. But you wanna make sure that if you're having something special, you get it approved before you have it done because it's awful to, to, to get a bill about a month later for a couple thousand dollars for something you didn't know you had to pay for. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, that's where the patient advocacy comes in. And of course, you also explained a little bit in the book, um, Anesthesia Without Fear. And of course, you can also be a patient advocate. And, um, you know, you know, if you feel that uh, you've been wronged by the wrong type of anesthesia or you had or say you had some differences with your anesthesiologist, doctors, and all that, so it explains um, what you can also do in the book. Yeah, we, we've come a long way in terms of safety of anesthesia. When I went into anesthesia, one in 4,000 patients had an anesthetic complication resulting in mortality. But now, you know, a few years later, 40, 50 years later, it's one in like 300,000. So it's very safe now to get an anesthetic because we have so many well-trained anesthesiologists out there. We have better equipment to monitor, to detect when something's going wrong. And we have better drugs that we use that cause fewer complications. So this, a lot has happened since then. Mm -hmm. and, and it does it does sound like it's um pretty much had had gone a long way as well too and of course um you know this this book anesthesia without fear is it's not just about you know you know what goes on as a st anesthesiologist and also the stories behind it and of course you know the patient advocate and everything it also serves uh for those who want to be an anesthesiologist we'll find out in just one minute you listen to the mike widener show at the mike widener show.com powered by sonic web studios and brought to you by our official sponsor the mike widener show international warring author mia molson zia missing available on amazon and paperback and ebook we'll be back with the author of the book anesthesia without fear dr james cottrell after this time we're back with the author, Dr. James Cottrell of Anesthesia Without Fear here on the Mike Widener Show. And, um, of course, we talked about some of the ins and outs of the book, Anesthesia Without Fear. And for those who want to get into the field, um, there's also a section on that. And um, it covers, um, you know, more about it. And what do you recommend and um, what should people look into if they want to become a future anesthesiologist? Well, first of all, they have to go to medical school. So that limits a lot of people because it's very selective medical school. You know, the testing and 
the the outside activities that you have to excel in and things like that to get into medical school is very difficult. I know we accept very few out of thousands. But once you get into medical school, then you go through the different rotations and you go through anesthesia as one of your rotations, like surgery or ob gyne or emergency room. And if you like anesthesiology, then you say, I want to be an anesthesiologist. And then in your third year, you do an elective in anesthesia. And that, that tells you for sure if you want to be an anesthesiologist. So after you finish and graduate from medical school, get your MD, then you have to do an internship. And you can do an anesthesia internship that's mixed with medicine, or you can do just a medicine internship. And then you have to do three more years of general anesthesia. So you learn all of the subspecialties. We've got all kinds of subspecialties, pain, neuro, regional, transplant, orthopedic, uh, cardiac, pediatrics, which is very important. So you can decide if you wanna do a year subspecialization in anesthesia. And so then after you do that, you have to take, you have to have your boards in anesthesia, and then you have a certificate of, su of subspecialization as well. So it's a, it's a long road to hoe. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, it's a great resource as well, too. And where can we find your book, Anesthesia Without Fear At? You can order it online through Amazon.com. And you can go on our website, anesthesiawithoutfear.com, and read all about it as well. Okay, we will certainly do that. We're here with Dr. James Cottrell of um, Anesthesia Without Fear here on the Mike Wagner Show. And just a few more things. Uh, what else can we expect from you in 2023 and beyond, James? Well, I think what we're doing now is we've controlled people who have serious injuries from anesthesia. Now we're trying to control some, some, some injuries that are not pleasant to have. I talked a little bit about cognitive dysfunction in the elderly. So we want to make sure we can prevent that from happening going forward. We also have studied and looked at behavioral and abnormalities in children after anesthesia and surgery. So we want to see what causes that and see how we can prevent that from occurring. We want to have non-invasive anesthesia. We like to have electrical currents that turn the brain on and off, if you can think of it in, in those terms. We'd like to have monitors that just monitor everything we do in terms of nerve blocks so we can see all the nerves and where the fluid goes and what we can inject. And 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 so I think there's the future is really bright. It's, it's gonna have critical care units where the patients come directly out of the operating room and go directly into the critical care unit and are supported and sent home on the same day. So it's not gonna be as difficult as it was before. Hmm. And certainly looking forward as well to it does look bright. And uh, who do you consider biggest influence in your career? What is what? Who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? Oh, I think it was my father. My father had lung cancer and he had severe pain. And this was back in 1952 and they would give him morphine and it wouldn't control the pain and he would throw up and have nausea. So, so there was real no, no good way to treat pain management. So I decided there's, there's gotta be a better way along, you know, along with the other things I decided. And so now we know we have all kinds of ways to, to let people die without pain with, with uh, terminal cancer. And I think that's just a wonderful thing to have happened. Mm -hmm. A lot of advances indeed. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Uh, know your anesthesiologist. Know what you want from your anesthesiologist. Tell them everything about yourself, what your illnesses are, what you want. And if it, ask the anesthesiologist if he's going to be present, he or she, during the whole procedure. That'll keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And certainly indeed as well, too. We're here with uh, Dr. James Cottrell of uh, Anesthesia Without Fear here on the Mike Wagner Show. J James, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. And once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your book? Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And what's your website again? Anesthesiawithoutfear.com. We will certainly check that out. Once again, James, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely amazing. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Live to have it back. Wish you all the best. And you got to buy that book in a great future ahead. And Dr. James, wish you all the best. You got a great future ahead of you. Thank you very much.